Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, it's great to see so many old friends, and it's uh, wonderful to see so many new friends because we plan on knowing many of you for a great many years beyond today. Um, Heartfelt Associates, we say we're in the business of trying to inspire people to care about each other and the world in which they live. Uh, we think Interpreting nature and history are very important. We think it's also important to get people to cooperate and to collaborate and to not always view themselves as being in competition with each other, but uh, trying to build a better world together. So th that's a part of our interest. Since last uh, August, we have been working as consultants. I had 17 years. It was my pleasure to be the executive director of NAI. Lisa, uh, 10 years with NAI. I would tell you that in a couple of weeks, we will have been married five years. We've been friends and colleagues 33 years. We've um, had the joy of living and working together the last five. So uh, it's great to be here with you and get better acquainted. Interpretive planning is the topic of our presentation. I pressed the up button. Was that a good thing? Uh, the down button. The down button. <laughs> okay. Um, I posed for many of these <laughs> pictures and trying to give you an idea of the evolution of interpretive planning, uh, we would suggest it's changed quite a bit over the last 60 or 70 years. And uh, I'm going to talk the first half of the, our time period and Lisa's going to take over after that. And she's going to signal me when I've gotten entirely too verbose. So uh, I, I would make the point that where we show the evolution of men as being a change to what we are right now. The evolution of interpretive planning, we have people at all different stages of maturity and development and how they've approached this. We think, uh, Sam was talking about the didactic approach. We think the, the early history of interpretive planning was very much about the object or the place. And it was information. In fact, we called, we called Forest Service interpreters VISTA information specialists. They were there to inform people. And we were, we were assessing our success by how much do people remember? And the answer is that's not a very good way to do it. Then we got into, uh, it's kind of dim in this light, but cool media. So uh, the problem with this stage of development for uh, interpretive planning is that we, we seem to be focused on how we communicate with people and not whether it was effective, not whether it was the right thing to be doing or not. I can tell you I worked at a state park early in my career and they bought every one of 103 state parks, they purchased a machine that would route wooden signs for us. And so that was the only medium we used for non-personal interpretation. We routed signs. They wouldn't give us a printing budget, so we couldn't print brochures. Now, I, I break the rules wherever I am. I, I believe in that. And uh, I'll try not to break any terrible rules while I'm here and end up spending more time in your country unnecessarily. But uh, they told us we couldn't print brochures or use other media back when I started. So I went out and bought an offset press and learned how to be a printer and started developing self-guided trail brochures. And I think we, we actually had at our meetings in the 1970s of the Western Interpreters Association and the Association of Interpretive Naturalists, sessions called Gimmicks, Gadgets, and Goodies. And our focus was on if we could train people to have enough of these, inter as Sam said, that entertainment approach that uh, we could take a rope with a knot in it and snap it in with one hand and a knot. We could make a whistle out of an acorn cap. Uh, we just were clever as heck about uh, keeping people engaged. To what purpose, we didn't know. But that's, that's what we were doing. <laughs> well, it's, I've, I've been down that lane. Uh, then along came an interpretive planning, the template approach. Kind of developed one great recipe and then fill in the blanks. And very often this included development of, of lists of the resources in the park, the, all the different things that were available to you. And then you had a template where you, you'd fill in the name of the organization, you'd fill in the kind of programs they were gonna do, the kind of media they were gonna use. And the problem with this template-based is that it assumed that everybody needed 
so, and the previous method assumed everybody needed some of the same media. So we built visitor centers where no visitor centers were needed. And uh, we, we, Sam and I and Lisa could share the history of uh, the federal organizations in the United States that built 10 and 20 and $30 million visitor centers only to abandon them 10 years later because they didn't have enough traffic to support them. There was, the interpretive planning didn't include enough consideration of uh, how it should be approached for that specific audience and those specific objectives for the site. And we think template-based planning should be passe, but it's still being used in some places. Worse yet, we see consultants who actually do it so well that if they're not careful, they will give a client an interpretive plan and the client reads through it and reads the name of the previous client on some line before they, they forgot to change it. <laughs> And so we think that's, that's not a very good approach. We believe that experience-based planning is a very much a part of what uh, we're teaching today because it helps people make those meanings for themselves. It is that ap approach that, uh, as Sam says, that helps people think about it and think more deeply about where they are and why they're there and why it matters to them. And hopefully that leads to uh, changes that are desirable. Uh, you mentioned the definitions project. I'm going to turn this over to Lisa in about 30 seconds. Definitions project was this great place where we realized that if you have a profession, you cannot be vague about what it is you do. And I can tell you that up until about 13 years ago, even at NAI, when people would call and say, well, what is interpretation? We would rattle off Tilden's definition, we would quote out of your book, Sam, your 1992 book. We would pick two or three other definitions that were in the literature, and we didn't land. The certification program really drove us to saying, this is what we do, this is why we do it, and experience-based planning is a big piece of that. And Lisa's going to take, am I going through this, or are you going through this? I can go through it, okay. <laughs> when you share everything, one of the things you have to do is find that perfect departure for the next person to speak. Uh, this is in Lisa's book that was published by NAI in uh, 2003 on interpretive planning, the 5M approach. Uh, and the ex experience model, we think, is important because it points out that it begins with the decision people make to go somewhere how they see it advertised, what, what other people talk to them about an experience. What's it like when they arrive? What, uh, so often we think interpretation is planned only in that center bubble, the connections phase. We're good at planning programs. We're good at uh, deciding what to put in the exhibit, but not recognizing that people make a decision to go there and it sets up their expectations. And if their expectations are set up incorrectly, then they, when they get to the connections phase, they're disappointed. They don't understand why it's not what they thought it would be. When you leave, certain things happen. Sometimes it's what we call the ask. We ask people to become a volunteer, to become a donor, to uh, return for another program, uh, to, to give that money. Sam's got a very important study with Lynn, Lindblad Expeditions he did where they increased donations to the Darwin Research Center by 270%. A powerful expression of using thematic interpretation effectively to get people to do something specific. In his new book, I wrote the, he was kind in asking me to write the foreword, and I talk about uh, interpretation really moved from uh, what I think of as 1.0 how we've been doing it the last 50 years to 2.0, a new method. And I think Sam's book is a great marker for that uh, modern approach, ex experience-based planning. You're going to have some money too after this, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Lisa is going to share with you some uh, other thoughts about this. Hi. Oh, good. They're still awake. They're good. It's good. Um, yeah, I, first off, let me just echo what Tim said. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, we were in Sweden about uh, 18 months ago uh, for a conference down in, in Gotland, in Visby. Was anybody here that was there? Just a few, okay, excellent. Well then, the rest of you are all new, that's wonderful. So what we talk about in terms of interpretive planning this, I think, may be the answer to some of the questions that you've been asking 
about how we get to that all-important justification for what we do. Because if we go out without a plan, we don't know what the end game is. We don't know what we're trying to accomplish. And so interpretive planning is really about establishing what that end game is that you want to achieve and how you get there. So when we talk about this holistic experience uh, that Tim just mentioned, we really are trying to create, through good planning, a way to engage people both emotionally and intellectually. So many of you may be familiar with the left brain, right brain uh, research, and of course it's not that simple. We know now, just from neuroscience, that things are really convoluted in, in your brain and everything doesn't necessarily just reside in one place. But in fact, this idea that you have sort of the intellectual pieces and the emotional pieces, this is what in good interpretation does so brilliantly. It braids the two. It allows that complete holism to take over. And so you're thoroughly engaged, which is a little different than just the entertainment piece, it's what starts you thinking, as Sam says. We also think it's important that it be appropriate. So we talk about, in interpretive planning, how to define your audience. And there's all sorts of different ways to segment an audience. You can say, oh, well, we have people from, just as we did this morning, we have people from Sweden, from Finland, from Denmark, and there's probably some characteristics that we could separate you out based on that description alone, but we might also want to think about how old you are, what life experiences you've had, what drove you to come here in the first place, what are you looking for, what is that that you are interested in so that we know how to play on that interest to get you to think deeper. We also talk about the idea of authenticity, making sure that what you encounter has real meaning because it is real. Now there are people who say to me, Disney World, completely fake. They don't do anything that's real. But think about that for a minute. Is it a real experience? Of course it is. So there are all sorts of levels of realness and fakeness, and our job is to try to create the atmosphere, the environment that can help people understand exactly where that line is drawn. So go ahead, the next one. We also talk about how we make it rewarding. How do we determine whether it's rewarding? And this is the part I think that people struggle with the most. It's rewarding not only to the individual, are they enjoying it, are they engaged, are they getting something out of it, does it matter to them? All of those things are important to the audience, but is it rewarding also to management? Does our managers, do our managers believe that interpretation has value because they can see something happen as a result? So this idea of creating some sort of of method of measuring whether the reward falls on the, the audience spectrum, the manager spectrum, somewhere in the middle, I think is, is incredibly valuable and it's a little tricky. And there's all sorts of different methods to do it. I am very interested in the research that's gonna come out of this place about measuring the thought processes. Because really what we're doing is we're trying to find out what changes or behaviors occur because we did something. Very often in interpretation, what we've measured is what we do. We did X number of programs. We put X number of zip exhibits in the exhibit hall. And we call it a day. And what we haven't measured, what we haven't done, is figure out what happens as a result of that. And that's that key piece that I think gives value to the profession and the individuals within it, is to say, something happened. 
Now that something could be the conversation, internal conversation or external conversation. That is a behavior. We want to see that something changes because we did something. Because if you're not trying to measure that, what are you doing? We're just spending money. And I don't know about you in Sweden and Denmark and Finland and Norway, in the US we don't have it to spend. We've got to be more wise about how we spend money and resources for these sorts of experiences. And the way we do that is to figure out, are we making a difference? Now, ultimately, what we're trying to achieve is some benefit either to the resource itself, we've, we've saved uh, the whales, or we've done something that benefits the agency or the organization. We've, it, it, we've increased the budget, we've done something, uh, gotten more volunteers, whatever that benefit is that we're looking for. But this piece of it helps us figure that out. Go ahead. And finally, of course, this idea of being thematic is critical. I won't go into this at great depth because Sam did such a good job of it this morning, but basically the idea behind a theme is a, it gives you that place to start. It's, it is that conversation starter, if you will. It's not that the theme tells you what to think, it's that it starts the conversation in your head. And if you're clear about what your theme is, then your audience becomes more clear about the questions to ask. So when we talk about a central theme, we're not identifying what this place is. We're saying, hey, come have a conversation with us about this. Let's discover it together. But it is the starting place. Go ahead. So I've just described you some characteristics of what we try to achieve with interpretive planning. Holism, it's got to be holistic, engaging, appropriate, rewarding, and thematic. It's that emotional and intellectual piece. You got to have heart. And if you do, go ahead then you may achieve what it was you were trying to, to achieve. Now, having said that, the big question is, okay, how do I get there? I understand that it's gotta be a holistic experience. I understand it's gotta be appropriate. It's gotta be rewarding and thematic. But how do I actually do that? And that's the interpretive planning process. Uh, Tim mentioned the book, The 5M Model, uh, which is the one that I wrote many years ago. And I wrote it because I found that no matter how many planning projects I did, they all had certain things in common. They're all very different, and the way to approach them is all very different. There is no one right recipe. Oh, he's got one back there. Uh, there's no res recipe for success here. The, my favorite phrase is, it depends. Okay, so, but these things are in common that you have to look at. First is management. You have to consider what those objectives are, the mission of your organization. Because if you are going to plan things that don't support your mission, you have wasted everybody's time. So understanding where the mission of your organization is taking you, how you get there. The other big piece of management is understanding what resources you have to work with. I can't plan a major visitor center or a nature center if I don't have staff to run it. Well, I could, but that's why we've closed so many in the United States. <laughs> so understanding what those operational resources is what I call them, understanding what you have helps you identify either what you need to get or what you have to work with to start with. Very important part of the process. I'm going to go through these very quickly because this is a whole college course and we're doing it in 20 minutes. Um, the markets is that audience piece, identifying not only who your audience is, but what their expectations are, uh, how much they're willing to pay for the experience, how they get from one place to another, all of those sorts of things uh, related to markets. The message piece is that thematic element. What are the stories we want to tell what do our audiences want to hear, 
and how do we blend those two together to start the conversation. The mechanics piece is that idea of the holistic piece. It's, it's how, do, how does everything fit together? How do people get from the parking lot inside? This is kind of uh, where it crosses that blurry line into design sometimes because you actually have to think about whether your busload of kids gets dropped off right in front. Do they walk a path up? Do they have to cross a street to get into the building? Those sorts of things all impact the overall experience. In media, I always put this on top. It appears that it's on top. Actually, it's it's because it's the last thing you do. If you go to media first, you're going to make some bad decisions. You may have been in that meeting where somebody says, I know, let's do a big map. We'll do a big map, and it'll have lots of buttons, and we can push them, and you don't know why you're doing it or what you hope to get out of it because you haven't done the homework on the other four pieces. So if you do those other four pieces, the media falls into place. You begin to understand what we need to do to make those connections for people. Okay, go ahead. So just very quickly, uh, in, our, in my last minute here, some of the emerging trends we see, we started by talking about kind of the evolution of interpretive planning. Uh, one of the things that we've been seeing in the United States over the last decade is a real recognition that planning does not equal design. They are two separate disciplines. Now, there is a sort of a blurry line between them at times, but they are different skill sets. Planners are not necessarily designers. Designers are not necessarily planners. Therefore, you need to think about how what the order is in which you hire people to help you, don't start with the design team. Get the plan down first. Uh, certainly use of best standards and practices. Uh, NAI, in addition to the definitions project that uh, Sam mentioned, uh, we put together several years ago standards and practices. Those documents are also on the website of NAI. And so we, there is one specifically about interpretive planning. So some of the best practices in interpretive planning are listed. And I like that they're on a kind of a scale. It's, it's a good, better, best. Because you're not always going to be in the position to, to be at the best end. Funding may be in the way. Staffing may be in the way. Managerial uh, mandates may be in the way. And so there's, there's this range of things that you can go to for best practices. Uh, also, the, the recognition of the certification as sort of a filter. And I know Amy and Margo are going to talk more about that this afternoon. Uh, if you have specific questions that um, you want to know about how that all got started, I'll, I'll be around happy to chat with you about that as well. But um, if you go on to interpnet.com, you can find the requirements for certification as an interpretive planner. There's about 170 of them in the world right now. And they are around the world. Uh, they're not just in the US at this point. So I was, I was pleased to learn uh, recently that somebody from the British Museum, the National Museum in, in uh, London, uh, said that they had to get that credential. They either had to have it when they were hired, or they had to get it within six months after being hired. It's open to anybody. Anybody can participate in that program. And I encourage you, if you have an interest, to go to the website, talk to Amy, talk to Margot, talk to us. We'll be happy to help you get started in that. I think I've got, oh, this is my last slide. Just if you do need help, um, ta-da. There's the second, that's the second edition of Interpretive Planning. Uh, it is available online currently. And it will be available as a print resource from NAI uh, soon. It, I think it's, it, if it's not at the printer now, it should be within the next week or so. Um, we also have another book called Put the Heart Back in Your Community. And those of you who are coming to the uh, conference in, over the next few days, we are going to be doing a, a more extended workshop on how to apply these interpretive planning principles to entire communities of any size. 
Um, and then finally, the personal interp as well. So these are all available online uh, if, you, if you need that sort, that sort of help. And last slide, that's us. So if you uh, need to get hold of us, we do have business cards. We'll put them out on that table back there. And we're happy to help you in any way that we can uh, with any of this. Questions? <laughs>